Oakwood University's origins are humble, and very much a part of the history of a humble people, newly freed slaves in the southern United States, looking at last to become full-fledged citizens of this nation. Guided by the vision of Ellen G. White and leaders like C.M. Kinney, the first black man to be ordained as a Seventh-day Adventist minister, Huntsville's old Beasley Plantation was selected as the ideal site for what was first named the Oakwood Industrial School. The journeys of Edison White and his Morning Star boat up and down the Mississippi recruited Oakwood's first students, hungry to learn and no doubt excited not only by freedom from slavery, but by the prophetic vision for the school that was articulated by Mrs. White. In regard to this school here at Huntsville, I wish to say that for the past two or three years, I have been receiving instruction regarding it, what it should be, and what those who come here as students are to become. All that is done by those connected with this school, whether they be white or black, is to be done with the realization that this is the Lord's institution in which the students are to be taught how to cultivate the land and how to labor for the uplifting of their own people. Why don't you let me ride? Why don't you let me ride? Why don't you let me ride? This call to mission from Ellen White has been the driving force in Oakwood's development and undoubtedly helped compel the first students to come here, students such as Samuel Johnson and Etta Littlejohn, whose son is Charles E. Bradford, former president of the North American Division of Seventh-day Adventists. Mrs. Little John Bradford also had a grandson who would one day play a pivotal role in Oakwood's history. His name is Calvin B. Rock, Oakwood's eighth president. A sense of mission certainly is what compelled Oakwood's first leaders, all of whom were white, to serve it and its students. There was no glory or fame to be gained by white educators who came south to Alabama to teach former slaves especially not since post-Reconstruction angst and anger were prone to target not only blacks, but their white sympathizers. Yet, Salon M. Jacobs, Oakwood's first principal, and his successors and associates came anyway to the industrial school that had been transformed from a plantation, the same site where the famous slave Dred Scott briefly lived before pursuing his freedom through the U.S. court system years later. In 1917, when Oakwood Industrial School became Oakwood Junior College, a new era was beginning, one with more of an academic focus and mission. More students were now being trained to be pastors, educators, nurses, and Bible workers. It was also during the junior college years that Oakwood would see its faculty become integrated, and eventually, in 1932, Oakwood would have its first African-American president. J. L. Moran. We called him King, uh, not only because he was president, but uh, I mentioned the fact that he was a leader manager, and the managing aspect came out in the resourcefulness of how he went about uh, taking care of those food stamps and so forth that we had. On the other hand, he led by example. Uh, Moran Hall, uh, the east wing of that was not completed, and uh, I remember how we got rocks from the rock quarry. And uh, Elder Moran led the way 
I mean, those rocks went anywhere from 30 pounds up to 70 pounds, and he picked those rocks up and just climbed that ladder, and, and all of us did. I helped carry rocks up there. In fact, uh, I don't know what the classrooms are now, but I laid floor on the first floor. What during my day was the Bible classroom and some of the business classrooms where they had accounting and what have you, uh, I helped lay those floors. But uh, he, yes, he would tell us to do it, but then he'd go out and show us how to do it. <laughs> it was as President Moran's tenure at Oakwood was drawing to a close that Oakwood Junior College became Oakwood College. My God is a rock in a Another name change, another step up the ladder of academic development, and another new era of progress and success at Oakwood. President Moran was replaced by F.L. Peterson, who was Oakwood's president for nine years. Garland J. Millett followed President Peterson and also had a nine-year tenure. Addison V. Pinckney became Oakwood's sixth president in 1963. He served three years. Frank W. Hale was appointed Oakwood's seventh president in 1966. In 1971, Calvin B. Rock became Oakwood's eighth president. Fourteen years later, Benjamin F. Reeves was appointed Oakwood's ninth president. Delbert W. Baker succeeded President Reeves in 1996, and President Baker was succeeded by current president Leslie N. Pollard in 2011. President Pollard is the only president who also has had the distinction of serving as the senior pastor of the Oakwood University Church. And this brings us back to mission, a constant thread in the pattern of development at Oakwood. It's seen plainly in the lineage of the university's black presidents, most of whom earned their bachelor's degrees at Oakwood, and some even worked for the institution in other professional roles before ascending to its highest office. A sense of mission can be plainly seen in those who were drawn to Oakwood, respected nurse and missionary Anna Knight, Dr. Eva B. Dykes, the first black woman to complete her Ph.D. and the first professor at Oakwood to have a Ph.D. Even Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. challenged throughout the South with bombings, jail, and death threats during the Civil Rights era, found time to preach his message of nonviolence at Oakwood in 1962. He found a receptive audience in Ashby Auditorium. We know that the struggle in the South, in the side of analysis, is not between black men and white men, but it is a tension between justice and injustice. It is a struggle between the forces of light and the forces of darkness. And let us lead our white brothers who are so worried about our advance. That if that is a victory, it will not be a victory merely for 20 million Negroes, but if that is a victory, it will be a victory for justice a victory for freedom, a victory for democracy, and it will make a better nation for everybody because the censoring soil of segregation debilitates the white man as well as the Negro, and we are struggling to see him. Oh, if you want God to lead you today, just sing the song with us real quick. Come on, help us, choir. Yeah, that's it, that's it. Along the way. Mission is the spirit and essence of Oakwood, informing all that we attempt to do. From the inspiring and challenging Open Your Mind lecture series created by Dean Tracy Holliday, to featured world-renowned speakers such as Dr. Cornell West, Dr. Michael Eric Dyson, community-minded celebrities such as actress Nia Long and outspoken activists such as Kimba Smith to the creation of the Bradford Cleveland Brooks Leadership Center, a tribute to the evangelistic legacy of three of the Seventh-day Adventist churches and Oakwood's most trusted servants. Mission has always mattered at Oakwood University. It is the reason we were founded and the reason for our continued existence. Serving at this institution is wonderful. 
I believe it's a calling. It's not simply a job. Do you believe that? Yes. We've been called to do this. The work that we are doing is sacred work. Do you believe that? Yes. It's sacred work. Yes, there's ordinariness about it. Day in, day out. Day in, day out. But if you ever just step back and look at the big picture, <clears throat> the calling that we have is a sacred calling. It's our responsibility to impact young lives for God and to help form them so that they leave here as able, effective servants for God. Oakwood University's best days are still ahead. But it's going to be contingent upon our deep and abiding dedication, our commitment to mission, our commitment to unity, our commitment to working together for the cause of God. Right now, one more time, quiet. Lead me. Hey.